My guest today is Jason Beeler from the notorious Saigon Kick, who many, many, many of you should know. And we're going to talk about a little bit about Silent Kick. Uh, si- Silent Kick? That's a shit name for a band. I, 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 was, I was rethinking my whole past now. Like, what the <laughs> It could have been great. We're going to be talking a little bit about Saigon Kick, and we'll also talk about his various other projects and your excellent new album. Thank you very much. Which we'll come back to. So, I've been listening to Saigon Kick most of the day, just to refresh. Back in the day there, back in the early 90s, you seemed to go from naught to 60 overnight. It was, um, there wasn't, I was, I was a tape trader, and you never came up on the lists. It, was, it wasn't a thing that happened, and suddenly there was this great band with an album seemingly out of nowhere. And yet I know that can't be how it happened. Saigon Kick did not get together with that level of uh, musicianship and songwriting overnight. No way. Uh, I don't no. think it was so much that as it, I think because we were from Florida and we weren't from LA or, or New York where there were kind of these big established scenes, we were kind of, you know, Florida is such a strange, well, it's a strange place under any circumstances, but you know, even if you talk about the music side of it, I mean, you had, you know, the Miami sound machine, uh, Marilyn Manson, us, Tom Petty, Molly Hatchet, uh, you know, death, all the death metal stuff that came out of Tampa. Um, so it was a very eclectic, just musical environment. There wasn't like 10 bands all doing the same thing. It was these pockets of kind yeah. of, uh, thing. So I think that kind of helped us. And we did it kind of backwards in the sense that we didn't have a demo tape or a promo photos or anything like that. We uh, started playing live. And, uh, you know, it's that old story of, you know, we played live and there was like 15 people there. And then there was 50 and then there was 100. And we built that up to the point where we were doing like 1500 people a night, sometimes two nights in a row at, at, at some of the venues in South Florida. And you know, literally over the weekend, uh, Atlantic Records had flown down. Michael Wagner, the legendary producer, was there. It was a Friday night or something like that. I we went across to like some restaurant and a legendary AR guy, Jason Flom, and Wagner said, Look, you know, if you guys can be in LA on Monday, we can start making your record because he had to do like the next skid row record or something like that in like three or four weeks. So there's this yeah, really brief window of opportunity. So it was a two year process of the band building and developing and, you know, playing shows, but not uh, it would definitely if you weren't in Florida, it would appear like we came out of nowhere. Right. Which answers the question very well. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to quantify success, isn't it? Looking back, I mean, having lived through that whole period and you you touched down in a notoriously difficult period. But you were a difficult band anyway, because you did exactly as you chose. There was no, you, you could never say, oh, Saigon Kick was this or that. You were just a great rock band. And there's only one other band I can think of that dug their own path like that, which was Life, Sex, Death. Yep. And they hung themselves well before you did. We actually did some shows with them. And I'm still friends with Alex. Alex but, is a trooper. Alex is friends with everybody. Yeah, there's not a person on earth that doesn't know Alex. But I mean, yeah, I, I think we we managed to really, you know, when we were first started, we toured with the Ramones. We toured with, uh, we did shows with Faith No More. We did shows with Soundgarden. We played with Ozzy. But we also played with Rat and Cheap Trick. And, you know, we were just into music. So, like, with, I don't think we were thinking with marketing hats as well as like, I think Alice in Chains kind of saw the transition coming and Pantera saw and kind of made the leap to one side or the other. We were just blissfully ignorant and walked directly into an oncoming train. So we were kind of hated by, for lack of a better word, the hair metal scene bands. They didn't really. And then because we were a diverse band and had success with a ballad, you know, we were never going to be adopted by the, the newfound grunge Seattle scene. So we wound up, you know, floating between these two massive musical movements and managed to not be a part of either one of them. Would you have jumped if you'd seen it coming? I don't think you would have. I don't know that we would have jumped. Um, and strangely enough, we didn't even release the ballad. Literally, a station started playing it. 
and it just exploded, you know, really on its own. And I don't make a, I mean, we had a ballad on the first record that didn't work. And I've always wanted to make music that I, I just always like diverse music. I don't like 12 songs of anything. Uh, so that was always kind of true to who I wanted to be as a writer. And, and I think what we wanted to do as a band. And now I think, strangely enough, I think it makes more sense now than it did then, because we were still coming out of that period of, you know, growing up and you were so you had to be either a metalhead or you had to be a punk or you had and you wouldn't even eat lunch with people who didn't like the same music as you at yep. school. And uh, it was such a part of your identity. And like now people don't care. It, they'll listen to Rihanna, ACDC, Metallica. You know, it doesn't matter. Just they just want good tunes. So people are a little more, a little less genre restrictive now than they were then. At some point after your third album, Water. Mm -hmm. So after Water, Matt left. No, Matt left before Water. Matt left before Water, right? So for the uninitiated, Matt was the vocalist, mm -hmm. and you took over. Yeah, a fact that. You could have easily missed if you weren't reading the small print. Oh, You're a good vocalist. He's well, thank, thank you very much. I mean, he is too, but it was it was quite seamless if you weren't looking. My friend think, said to me that you were you're, you're the Jerry Cantrell of of Saigon Kick. Like it right. doesn't matter who leaves, they always sounds the same. That's well, yeah, I think Matt's a great singer and had a huge impact on the band. I think the reason why a lot of that stuff kind of felt that way is because I wrote a lot of the material. Yeah. Demoed a lot of the material. I did all the vocal parts on the demos and then would kind of present them that way. And then when we were doing the songs, you know, people would learn different parts and kind of do it. So I think the general framework and structure was what I was already doing. And um, yeah, no disrespect. I mean, I, I, Matt, Matt, had you know was a great singer um but i think you know, we were definitely a 50 50 vocal sound yeah do you still speak this is going to come as a shock to you but we're actually a band that hates each other like no other band on earth <laughs> uh, we're the first band ever to have a falling out and not be on great terms <laughs> not true i know this <laughs> no do you see each other much or or never no, we, 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 I mean, I speak to some of the guys. I speak to Phil on occasion, uh, Chris uh, quite a bit. Uh, Matt, I haven't talked to him in a long, long, long time. So, it, it, I mean, I've been, I've been, I was in a band for mm, 10 years. One of the guys I'm in touch with, my best friend, the other guys, I don't even know where they are, but people assume, don't they, that you're a gang and you'll be together forever and there's some kind of weird magic, but it's never like that in reality. No, it's it's a super hard dynamic, you know. I mean, to, it, it, especially when you're pouring, everybody's pouring their creativity into it, and it, it, feelings get hurt. And and uh, you know, I'm a pretty, uh, you know, I, I I can be a pretty spoiled toddler and want to do exactly what I want to do when I want to do it. So that that makes me probably a pain in the ass to work with as much as anything else. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I I, I just kind of. For better or worse, I know what I want to do and how I want to do it. And that doesn't always play well with others, you know, and I think uh, and on, on top of that, just being with anybody, you know, yeah. uh, it, it, that, you know, being with one person, you know, that kind of proximity on a bus, on a plane, it, you know, sleep deprived, traveling constantly in each other's face, hearing the noises they make or what you just wind up wanting to really commit murder. So when you put a band together and a crew, I mean, it's it's a miracle. There's not more kind of like just murders. Yeah. 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 Which kind of neatly brings us up to the bit that I don't know, which is what happened next? Because the whole world kind of, I don't know, grunge was a bit, grunge to give it a, its awful title kind of is a bit like punk over here mm -hmm. in the, it was actually very short lived, you know, and, the, and then three bands rose to the stratosphere and, but they were no longer grunge. And, but what happened after Saigon kick for you? I mean, did you go into production or start I writing was, for other people? Or? I was producing, started producing a bunch of stuff and I started a record label. This is really condensing a, a little bit of stuff. So 
At the same time, I wound up doing some music for the American Pie soundtrack. Me and Pat Badger from Extreme. Yep. Had a, had a, had a project that we did together for that. And I started, you know, just being aware of other bands and starting to work with them. I found a band called Nonpoint in uh, Florida. So I wound up producing their first record. And uh, that led to a, doing more productions, uh, starting a label, uh, worked with the band. I'm sure you're familiar with Skin Dread, who mm-hmm. are just as good as it gets in my book. So worked with them. The label kept growing, worked with bands like Carnival, Sixth, Death Stars, Ankla, forgetting on a fiction plane. You know, we had a great run kind of as an independent rock label and worked with a lot of really cool bands that I'm super, super proud of. And uh, yeah, so I spent, uh, you know, a chunk of time doing productions and, and kind of the ugly side of the record business and kind of getting my PhD. And, you know, a lot of artists always like to complain about the record business without really understanding how any of it works. So I think by being in a band on a major label, having a degree of success, then starting a label, working with other bands, I finally realized I hate everybody. Did you spend weekends in the garage packaging things up and taping boxes? And I just don't want to work with anybody. I just want to do my own thing. I don't want to talk to bands. I mean, I love them all dearly. So I don't I don't mean it like seriously, but I hate labels. I hate managers. I hate, you know, I hate talking to Ray. I, I, I just I just want to do what I want to do. Like I said, like a little toddler with toys. These are my toys and this is how I want to play with them. I'm not bitter in that sense. I love everybody. I still have friends all over the industry and stuff like that. But I just realized after a long while, I just wanted to kind of do my thing how I wanted to do it, which led me to where I kind of am now. But but that's that's got a plus side in that the amount of material you're putting out is off the scale. I mean, for just to fill in there, so we have so so when you're done producing in the main, does owl stretching come next? That whole process, I guess, ultimately did lead to this. But I didn't want to make a record. I didn't want to spend time in the studio. And get lost in like, you know, spending two weeks on a snare reverb or something. I wanted to write. So I figured I would set this limitation for myself. And I wanted to write, record, and release in 24 hours a song. So from the time I started to write it, I wanted it to be on Bandcamp in about 24 hours, maybe 36 hours, worst case scenario, and then move on. And the whole point was not for commercial aspirations. I just wanted to get better as a writer and as a musician yourself. I mean, you know, it's the best way to get better at writing is to write. You know, it's not it's no real great secret. So I wound up doing probably like a hundred and something songs, just kind of constantly sharpening the tools. And it developed its own cult kind of following. Yes, it did. I mean, it was just brilliant, you know, and I, I couldn't be more thankful for that. And then uh, as that started to, you know, do its own thing, I was like, you know, maybe I should really kind of think of this as more a project and do, you know, and and maybe bring it to life a little more fully realized. And that led me to the place I am now. Which is under your own name. My own name in the Baron Von Bielski Orchestra. Which comes from Um, some corner full of cobwebs in your mind. One, I love the fact that people have a hard time saying it. So that brings me great pleasure. (laughs) Uh, uh, But I also wanted it to be this free-formed, kind of collective where I get to work with all the people that I find interesting, compelling as musicians, as people, friends. And I've been so lucky to have, you know, Devin Townsend and Clay Cook and Stephen Gibb and uh, Todd LaTorre and Marco Miniman and Rio Akamoto and uh, Clint Lowry from Seven Dust and Benji from Skin Dread. And, you know, I've really been able to pull this collective of people that I admire and, and think the world of and have them be a part of this. And being an orchestra, technically, just gives it a free form feel to it where I can really go in any direction, do anything with anybody I want. And um, it's been unbelievably like rewarding to be that kind of free. Do you, do you get unwell with band camp? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, because it, was, it seems to be your main home really is. I love what they do. I think it's the, the people who support me there are like unbelievably generous and, and kind and have been just, you know, I mean, I can't believe the amount of pre-orders that people, you know, took their hard-earned cash and put out, you know, months before a record was going to street. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm super thankful for that. I mean, so it, it's one part of a, of a large business, but one that's really important to me because, you know, it's, it's just direct to fan kind of no, again, I don't have to spend any time convincing a retailer or, yeah. or, you know, try to get on a, a playlist on some other platform. You know, it's, it's bit by bit, brick by brick building this own universe and it, it's 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 been super rewarding that's not to say i've been really lucky with spotify and really lucky with apple has been amazing to me and you know get especially as momentum builds on these records people have been fantastic so um you know i'm always happy to bring more partners into the into the universe of, that we're that we're trying to create but uh yeah band camps one of the one of the mighty pillars of the center of it for sure were you never tempted to to bring it all in house and cut them out or does it just work better I mean, like that i did some stuff way, way back in the label experimentation you know i, mean, I think band has got a really good seamless band a, a, tr- you know, a place where people feel comfortable spending money okay yeah which and is that's important. a big that's a big thing too like when you go to a random website like as much as i like a new artist or so I'm like yeah i don't want to stick my credit card in john you know the metal lord's uh yeah. you know, back end <laughs> system here and wind up, you know, some kind of weird thing. So I think people trust as, and especially, I mean, they've done hundreds of millions of dollars in transactions. So via Bandcamp, not me. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, and people love it and, and they're, and they're, uh, and it's been growing. And so it, it just, it's been, it's been good. But I mean, it's, it's difficult because I was just looking at your pages, the new album there. If I wanted to buy vinyl from you, the shipping to the UK is off the scale. It's it's robbery. There's no way regular people are going to be buying product if it wasn't presented that well, way. Here's here's how it goes. And I even say it on the page itself. I feel terrible for people in the UK. I saw, yeah, yeah. Like I please don't. I mean, if you're a mad collector and you want that red vinyl and that's something that's really important to you, like even that I'd rethink it. But I appreciate it and I will get it to you and it'll go. It cost us like twenty dollars to send it to the UK. Yeah. Period. I mean, it's like, it's like, no matter how, I mean, I don't even think I have an option to do it slower than that. And um, it, it's just, it just, it sucks that in this day and age, that thing, you know, in the U S we have a thing, I'm sure you have it internally in the UK, it's called media mail. So like, you know, you can mail CDs in the U S and, and vinyl in the U S for relatively cheap, like $3. Yeah. $4. Yeah. I think it is something like that. But to, to ship to the UK or anyplace else, it's just a nightmare. Uh, and obviously with Brexit and all the different like things that have changed now, and it's it's just become way more complicated. So what I say to people is we are physically going to distribute product in the UK and, you know, all over Europe. Uh, there'll be, I don't know how much of the yellow vinyl will make it there, but there'll definitely be black double vinyl that'll be sold domestically uh, at a more reasonable, normal, yeah, yeah. normal price. So it's just, it's one of the battles that, you know, it's, it's like, I'm probably one of the only people that read that. Like, please don't buy this if you're in Germany. Like, just wait; it's going to happen for you. You know. I guess, I guess the only way around that is to, if if you happen to come here, stuff a suitcase yeah. and find a cl- somebody that you trust. Yeah, to I mean, ship it well, out. But the other, the other, the other part of that is coming over there with a suitcase of vinyl. You know, customs are always so. You know, coming into the U.S. and going out of the U.S. is a uh, you know. They're always so, oh, sure. You have one vinyl is one thing, but you have 50. What do you do? A hundred, you know, what are you doing? You're obviously selling. Yeah. Going into the US is strange. It's the whole, the whole, I, I, I've become, <laughs> I'm a real, I just watch the whole world. It just seems like it's falling apart at the seams and making terrible decisions, not only in business sense, but just human being sense. And it's just a constant state of like, it's just like a Monty Python sketch gone horribly wrong. The, the, yeah, the whole I, just, world is... I saw something on the on uh, some Twitter feed yesterday about um, I was <laughs> so, somebody got somebody got shot, and one of the senators said, "Who's in charge of of this state? Oh, it's the Democrats." But it, 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 I don't know. You the U.S. has just gone really like there's no way no one got shot in a state run by Republicans. That's not a, that's not maths you can do and the, gloat over. The whole political thing, the whole system's insane. Like, I mean, it's just, and I, I mean, I know you feel probably the same way in the UK and it, you see it in France and you're seeing it, you know, in Germany and there's, it just feels like 
I don't know if it's some kind of like virus <laughs> that's like secretly infiltrating half of the population of the world, but there just seems to be a large degree of idiocy abound in, in, in like just general decision making, just general being a decent human being, you know, uh, just seems to have gone the, you know, we keep watching these shows, The Last of Us and, you know, The Walking Dead. And I'm like, it's happening right in front of your eyes. And, you I know, think not- it became bad when, when it became public. So it was okay all the time that things weren't televised and they weren't speaking on social media. That was okay because you saw, you read it in the newspaper and you got on with the day. But now we've fed it constantly, and oh, they're, so it, and it's they're not media to, trained. It's just set up to agitate and divide. And I think, while I think there are definite issues to discuss that have valid points about helping humanity and people and all that stuff, when politics becomes sports, and you're going to root for Manchester United no matter what because your dad wrote or whatever you know or the Dallas Cowboys it's a, doesn't matter how bad the team is or but that's what politics has become it, it, it's no longer about the idea being the best or that kind of concept it's like this is my team and i don't care if they're lighting babies on fire and throwing them out windows that's my team and i hate the other team and i think when it became a sport or like a you know like a entertainment value sport and I'm sure it always has been that way. I don't know. I, I, I used to. No, enjoy but now, it, now it's knocked onto ratings, isn't it? So, and because oh, yeah. the ratings are involved, the media has taken sides. Well, the only that's way to keep people too. watching is to keep them angry and scared. So, you know, the one side is constantly telling you all these things that are going to make you go like, I can't believe they're saying that. And then the other side is getting, and, you know, these guys want you to, you know, they want all your children to become transgender and oh, I can't have that. And, you know, it's, it's like this constant stupidity of like, yeah. it's it just trigger points to keep people mad. And the more mad they get, the more they watch, the more they root for their team and hate the other team. And uh, hence where we are as a world, I guess. On which yeah. topic? <laughs> you, <laughs> no, on which topic? You don't seem to, or not so as I've noticed, you, you don't seem to be political at all in your songwriting. Um, unless it's very underhand and disguised, I think it's in there. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm just a, I like people one on one. I think I go back to the George Carlin thing. It's groups of people I hate. Yeah, but generally speaking, whether my you know people I've met are conservative or my you know neighbors or as long as we don't talk about politics, I find people delightful. Like I enjoy having a beer with a guy and talking you know about this or that other thing. Or people are great like that. Um, it's it's just when they get in these little cliques and groups and rallying and and and, and uh, you know and and I just I find the whole thing stupid. Like I am not a fan of anybody because of a party or blind following anybody. Uh, so I think there's idiots. There's plenty of idiots to go around on all sides. There's dumb ideas everywhere. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm not like a blindly into anybody i think i really don't think anybody in the government cares about anybody that's not serving a purpose for their own military industrial complex contracts and yeah you know and, and those types of things i mean I really at the end of the day they don't care about people no nope. true let's draw a line there because what i really want to talk to you about is your songwriting sure. good and it's always a shit question because there are so many ways I mean, personally, I can't even begin to write a song without a title. That is always, if I don't have a title, I'm blown. I may as well watch TV. But do you have little odd things like that? I mean, the process that's always been for me is it's like it's literally like I have bizarre radio stations playing in my head at all times. So something comes to me generally fully, relatively fully formed, surprisingly to like when I try to explain it to somebody like the vast majority of the lyrics, melodies and structures kind of come out really quick and all in one piece, which makes me a terrible collaborator because if I'm in a room with somebody and I'm trying to get it down. No, it goes like this. So, you know, we put a harmonica. I'm like, you know. But that, that's the way it's always been for me. And I, I don't, I, I almost fear like kind of analyzing it too much. It'll, I feel like it's going to go away or something. Like, I, you know, I, it's always been there for me. It's been my reliable, like, you know, imaginary friend since as long as I can remember. Yeah, it's just always there. The trick for me is to be able to have a conversation 
and not be hearing these things in my head constantly. It's not an annoyance or a, uh, you know, or that in that sense, but it's like if I'm sitting there watching something or listening to something, like there's just always this kind of thing going on in my head where I'm like, oh, that's kind of a neat, and I don't pay attention to the people around me as much as I should. I hear that. Are you here? Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times the wife has thrown stuff at me from across the room like, what? I assume you're a multi-instrumentalist. I like to think I am. I Well, I don't think I'll win competitions on many different instruments, uh, but I can functionally play piano, bass, rhythmic ideas and things like that, you know, enough to execute basic frameworks of what I want to do, yeah. So, so with your solo stuff, has any of it exclusively been solo? Are you able to demo up songs and go, oh, yeah. hey, that's good enough? No, um, I'm trying to think. Well, all the songs like de- generally get built like a framework and, and uh, are generally realized in that sense as a song. And then what I love doing, which I think gives a massive depth and width to the record is having people like Andy Blackshirt or, or Marco Miniman or these guys come in and then really add this different tech. Because I think sometimes, you know, no matter how diverse I am, I, I think you're going to get, a, you know, too much of one person's thoughts that can have a tendency to sound flat, you know, just across yeah. the record. It doesn't have, so I, I really rely on these guys to kind of bring different senses of rhythmic and, and sonic and diff, you know, so, so the record, I wanted to have it, have a push and pull and a and a little bit more of a, a living, breathing kind of feel to them rather than just this kind of static, my interpretation of everything. So are you willing to collaborate lyrically as well? I haven't so far. There you go. Good. Um, I like that. Yeah, I mean... People, I, I, people shouldn't. It's like me joining in your sentence. Yeah, it's... It, it's um, but I mean, I... I don't think I wouldn't. I mean, there's friends of mine that are great writers. Like we talk about Butch Walker or we talk about, you know, another buddy of mine, Matt Nathanson and these different guys that are great. You know, they're great songwriters. I think it'd be fun to maybe do something. I don't think I would really want to present them a song and then watch it get dissected. Like, yeah, in that sense. But it may be fun to sit together and, hey, let's do this idea. And like, you know, oh, and you can say that and I can say, that. oh, that's cool. That makes me think of it. That might be a fun thing to try. I mean, there's there's another guy there, Butch Walker, who pretty much did exactly the same as you have. Production, songwriting. He's done pretty he's, well for himself. He's carved out a good little niche. Yeah, he's done great. And he's a great guy. And we've known each other since he was uh, in South Gang. So we've kind of, it's funny, we, we came across, when Saigon Kick was playing, we came across, we became like social then. And then when I was doing that band Super Trans lineup with Pat Badger, he was doing Marvelous 3. And we actually did a show together. And then we, you know, every once in a while would stay in touch. You had done some stuff at my studio. And then uh, when I was doing the first record, I had called him up and said, hey, would you want to play on it? And he was like, of course. And so it's just kind of neat to see both of us. Obviously, he's done some pretty huge things, but just watch the career, his career tra- trajectory has been fun to watch. Is that is that not something you'd... I guess you don't write like that. You don't really write in a way that you could go... I'm going to write this for Pink. You're not that kind of artist, really. I haven't, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't. I mean, I, I, I mean, I love songwriting. Yeah. So, I mean, I, but I've never put that hat on, you know what I mean? Or, 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 or sat down and said, you know, you know what Taylor Swift could use? It could be a fun experiment. Not that Taylor I, Swift needs my songwriting. I mean, she seems to be doing quite well with what she's doing. True. But there are some, there are some. Kelly Clarkson could use a lift right now. Well, couldn't we all? <laughs> what? What's? I mean, you you just keep moving. I mean, the um, owl stretching. There's just so much material there. You could. It's just fantastic. Your own stuff is fantastic. Thanks. Is your plan just to keep moving till somebody stops you? You know, I, I mean, we. Yeah, I think when you're a kid, you grow up and you realize, you know, oh, I want to be Zeppelin. I want to be the Beatles. I want to be, you know, I want to have that kind of thing. But ever since I've been 18, I've been a professional musician. I haven't had to work a real job in my life. So in my mind, I'm as lucky as you get. I mean, there's some people that are a little bit more lucky. But 
I'm so fortunate to be able to get up in the morning, make a coffee, go to my studio and build an imaginary world. I don't have to get up. Uh, and there's people that are equally, if not more talented than me, they're getting up and doing plumbing all day long and getting up and digging holes and putting, you know, um, so it doesn't, it doesn't go past me how fortunate and lucky I am. So, yeah, I mean, I want to, I, I want to, uh, continue on as long as I can. For me, the thing is, I want to keep getting better. I don't know if that always means bigger. I don't know if that always means more successful in terms of selling things. But unlike an athlete, like I have some friends that play professional ice hockey. You have a limited window of like how long your body's going to hold up and how, you know, if you're, you know, you might get to 35. If you're, you know, rarity, you might get to 40. If you're a freak, you know, yeah. uh, but generally it's going to be over by that point. And music's one of those things I think, you know, you can still keep getting better. I mean, you can just keep getting better. Again, that's not the same thing as bigger or necessarily more popular, but I know I'm getting better. And and that's really rewarding. Um, and that's what's fun. Like, I kind of want to keep pursuing and seeing where it all leads. What do you judge yourself against with your getting better? Just my ability to execute what's in my head. You know what I mean? So it's presumably like, a lot of the things that came before you think could have been better if you were better. Can you look back and go, or do you just not look back? I don't look back generally. And I don't, I mean, it's impossible to, to uh, for me to look at it that way because every one of those steps has led me to where I am. So had I done those things different, then this would be different. And, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those kind of never ending loops of uh, very wise you know, logic, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, I just judge it on like, you know, just, am I pushing myself? Am I challenging myself? Am, uh, you know, I, can I do, you know, am I using different things? Am I kind of expanding my palette a bit? You know, am I, am I utilizing all the music I'm listening to in, in terms of things I absorb and, you know, am I filtering that in a cool way that's pushing my music maybe in different ways. I really don't want to, I, I want to try. I mean, I think it's hard not to repeat yourself in some respects, but I don't no, want to very keep much, doing yeah. the same thing. You know what I mean? I'm, it's hard when it's always your voice. I mean, no, yeah. no, unless you're a musician, people listen to the music and go, that's him right? singing. You know, most people don't see past that, do they? No, I, and I know for a fa I mean, I don't consider myself a singer in the traditional sense. I think I have a sound. Some of my favorite singers have sound. I mean, I love Perry Farrell. I love Tom Waits. I love, you know, York, and although she's a brilliant singer as well. But I mean, but I think I do have a thing. You do. So the second I apply that thing, it's going to sound, whether it's a ballad or a prog, it's, it's going it, to, people go like, oh, it sounds like. Yeah, that's Jason. But that's not a bad thing. I mean, I, th I no, think. No, not uh, at all. I mean, that's you know, what I, that's what that's that's what you have to hang your hat on. I think. I think you know. Yeah, I mean, you 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 don't want to be one of those unidentifiable, bland middle rock bands that could be any other band. You know, I you know, you never. And again, I'm not equating myself to the greats, but you know, you generally do. Go on. You, Go on. You know, you kind of Pink on. Floyd and all these guys that are my my peers. But you know what I mean? Like you you, you they were in they they had a voice. Uh, and I don't just mean vocal voice. I mean they—they they were you kind of understood Queen and and obviously the Beatles and 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 uh, even Metallica and you know all the great Bowie obviously and you know like we talked about Tom Waits. There's just a thing that they do. You you always hope that you can achieve that kind of you know. And I think especially with someone like Bowie, the brilliance of that is not that I am the first person to say Bowie is brilliant by any stretch, but just the constant pushing of the envelope uh, to new places and new areas. And even when it would have been much more commercially safe to do another record that was exactly like let's dance, you know? Yeah. And it's funny because of how much a risk that was to all the people that loved him prior to that record. We're like, Oh, and you know, the thing I love about that career path is that some of the music he made at the time was, I wasn't ready for. So some of the stuff that I was like, uh, I don't know about that. Is now I'm still not stuff. ready. Still not ready for Tin Machine. Really? <laughs> Under the Gods is a great tune, though. <laughs> it's still. It's uh, no. I'm going to listen to something else. Thanks. But well, you know what I'm saying? It's funny. Like at the time, you're not ready for some of those records, or even some of Queen's. So stuff I didn't love by Queen, 
when it had come out is now some of my favorite queen stuff. Like, you, you know, sometimes as a listener, you have to grow into that. And I love artists that go places ahead of the crowd and we have to catch up. Yeah. And by the time you've caught up, they're already, they're already doing something different. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What, what sort of a studio are you running there? Have you got a big desk or are you computer? Or both? Uh, I, I've been doing it more and more in the box um, just because of the way I work. It allows me to jump from thing to thing that I can mix a song, jump to a vocal, go to another track, do a guitar part, and everything's exactly the way it was. So I love that, um, you know, that ADHD kind of ability to just jump everywhere and everything stays content. I had an Eve console for a long time and I loved it, but every time I turned it on, it sounded different. You know, it, it, the, the analog gear is wonderful, but if it heated up the wrong way, if, you know, what the humidity was different, you could even re- pull everything back exactly like it was and it was just different. It was, it never can't, you never walked in the next day and had it sound the same, but I still have a lot of really great preamps and a lot of cool microphones and a lot of great amps. And I try to, you know, I'd say I have a hybrid approach in general. So it's it's not like I'm recording everything in GarageBand. Not that GarageBand is not brilliant, but I got to say I, I I only use GarageBand because I understand it. Right. <laughs> Anything hey, more than four tracks, we've gone too far. <laughs> too far. But that's the whole. That's the whole thing. You don't want the technology to get away with the creativity. You know what I mean? Like it, yeah. And I, I found that years ago. That's why I went. That's really what started my writing experiment because. I would just get lost in a plugin for like I'd be writing a song and then I'd pull up a reverb and I was like, oh, I can pull <laughs> this reverb in from like this church in the south of France and it's like, listen to that, and I'd forget what I was writing. Yeah, and two and hours I, later, yeah, there's no song, but the reverb's amazing, and uh, so yeah, the technology. I I I'm more and more conscious of it not being in the way, and I'm more and more conscious of speed, the ability to have an idea and get to that point as quickly as possible um, without being distracted because I'm easily distracted. So, so with your, with the owl, when you were doing your 24, 24 hour turnaround, has that stuck with you? So, so with the new album, were you still in the same, Oh, that, that'll just take me one day. Are no, you still keeping I mean, it really short? I wrote a lot more songs and I know I've, I've given people a pretty dense audio, you know, in a day and age where everyone's like, just release EPs, just release EPs. You know, no one's got the time to listen to full. Re- I've, you know, went and made a record that's like, you know, a five hour long. Uh, We've got time. You know, if you like something, something, you've got time. Yeah. I mean, I, it, to me, it's, I spent a lot of time just making, it, it, it's funny because like, I've developed this group of people around me. Uh, you know, I hate saying fan base, but the people that are into what I do, that I know I have to challenge them. So no matter how good a heavier song is on the record, I can't give them five of it. Like yeah. they're going to, they want, they want, they, I, I think part of the allure to what we do is that they're always surprised. They don't always know what's going to happen next. And those are always my favorite movies. Like that's why I'm not really, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything against a good old fashioned superhero saves the day, gets the girl thing. But I always love it when I'm totally shocked. Like, I can't believe that's where things went. And I think my bass has really been into that. So I spend more time making sure that I pulled songs that, you know, kind of have that. So so it flows like a movie and has peaks and heaviness and quirkiness and tongue in cheek and darkness. And, you know, try, try to make sure it's just that mm-hmm. feel. That, that's, that's where I spend more of my time. And as a bonus for people in the US, let me just pull this up here. You're going, you've got some dates, haven't you? You're yeah, playing. yeah, but that's different. Ah, why is it different? Is that because just those, you? Those shows, uh, I've also been lucky enough to have a lifelong friend and a guy named Jeff Scott Soto. Uh, I know of he, Jeff. Yep. So Jeff's yeah. one cool. of the great singers in metal, of course. We wound up doing these shows together, which are almost like a vaudeville insane. You know, it has more to do with Flight of the Concords or, you know, Tenacious D than it does with the traditional thing. And we started doing these shows all around the country and they started selling out. Again, like most of my endeavors, I don't plan on anything. And all of a sudden it starts going well. The second I sit down and try to plan something to go well, it's a disaster every time. We started going around the country and doing these shows. So, um, yeah, we have a bunch of those shows coming up in terms of the full 
band shows around this record, we're looking towards the end of the year into next year and hopefully into the festival season uh, to, to, to do those shows. Will you leave the US? Unlikely. Uh, I'd love to. Touring in Europe is hard these days, isn't it? I think touring anywhere is hard, you know. But you I, can I, get on a bus there and you can drive state to state. and. Yeah, but I still want to. I mean, it's been too long since I've been to the UK in, in terms of playing shows. And, you know, and, and fortunately, you know, we're working with a great guy over there named Duff, Duff from Duff PR. He, he's just taken the record on, a good friend of mine in France. And the record's starting to really develop a, a bit of a head of steam. I don't anticipate becoming the next Drake. But it's it's taking on a really cool, beyond my expectations in terms of people's response. The reviews have been really amazing, and I'm hoping that gives us the uh, the ability to bring it live outside just the U.S. That would be quite something. That's my hope. It's probably not suitable for your kind of thing. Where I know, I know people like Corey Clark, Jizzy Pearl have a band here. They just fly okay. over, pretend they're on holiday. Let's go. That's not going to work for you, is it? Well, I mean, there's some musicians over that I'm actually a huge fan of. So, I mean, I wouldn't rule it out per se. You know, Dan and Aria from Skin Dread are, and are phenomenal. Well, that's true. They're over here, aren't they? So it's not something I would generally rule out. But my only thing about this, these two records are, I feel like they've been put together. There's kind of this cinematic element to them. Um, there's a visual element to them. And I want them to be done live right. That doesn't mean that I anticipate we're going to be playing Wembley Stadium anytime soon. But I want it to be presented. In, I, I don't want to just half-ass it and show up at Jimmy's pub and, you know, plug in the back line that's not working and and ramble through the tunes. You know, uh, I, I want them to, you know, to, to be executed in, in, in the way I'd like to see them executed. So, yeah. I mean, I've, I've watched uh, a few of your acoustic shows on YouTube. I love acoustic shows. I think it, if there's one way to show off your songwriting, it's with an acoustic. Oh, yeah. One of your favorite things to do or hate it? I love it. I mean, I, especially because of the way, I mean, I think w- when you see what I do or what we, Jeff and I do, it, it's not the typical, like after, like when I see even my favorite people do acoustic sets, it's like, okay, two, three songs in, I'm like, okay, I got it. I can't sit here now for three hours while you go off into like emotional, you know, land of like that. So and I love the interaction. I love being close. I love, like you said, the songs, seeing whether they really have legs. Because a shit song does not work. You know, fall you, apart with an acoustic. Yeah. You, you can Us. get away with it with power and lights and you know energy. But when you really try to pull something apart and you play it in the acoustic guitar, it, it's either a good song or it's not. I think I covered everything. I did. That's awesome. I did. What's next for you after this? Just carrying on? Yeah, I'm doing the same. I mean, next week we're Jeff and I are doing the Monsters of Rock cruise with Extreme and Queensryche and Tesla and that whole <laughs> that'll be fun. Knuckleheads, that'll uh, be fun. And then Jeff and I have a bunch of shows all over the country. So we're playing Tampa, and New York, Boston, Philly. We just did Los Angeles and Vegas a bit. So we're doing a bunch of stuff like that, and then just really staying on the press kind of train for this record, and you know, watching hopefully. And seeing it keep growing, it's just been unreal. I'm intrigued as to how, and you don't have to answer this. I will. As to how an indie artist fares on the road now that you're not backed by anyone. So is it uh, is it like being a wrestler in which you take turns driving the car and shack up at a cheap motel? Or is it a little bit better than that? Or We've been really strategic and and uh, and very lucky. Like I said, by no means am I trying to tell you that we're selling out arenas all over the country, but we've been selling out really nice venues and we fly and we stay at nice hotels. My days of waking up in a van behind a venue are long behind me. But if you're uh, flying I, and have nice hotels, that has to be a good barometer of success. Well, I, I you know, it, it is, and I'm very grateful that we can, we can do it that way. I, uh, but I also just I I don't want to you know that's a young man's game. Yeah, you know, you know when I was 17, someone could say you got to drive 24 hours straight on a moped with all your gear in a backpack and why you know in a blizzard to play one show in front of four people in you know, okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> now I'm like, well, what kind of restaurants are near that venue? Yeah. And what kind of hotels do you have? Uh, I, I, we, we can't play there. Is there a jacuzzi? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, <laughs> what time does your masseuse shut down? Because if they're, yeah. <laughs> is there a spa open all night? Yeah. yeah. Those, those are the kind of important questions at this point. Well, getting old, it comes yeah. with its um, thing, doesn't it? You've done your yeah, time. I mean, like I said, we just want to, you know, I, I think we've, you try to weed out the stuff that's not important. And you're, you know, I, I've become very conscious of, you know, at least trying to eliminate anything that's nonsensical and just seek joy and pleasure and fun. And so I, I really like to make sure that the venues are great. The staff is great at those venues, that the people who are coming to see us are treated well, you know, that it's, it's, you know, it, it's just a pleasure. You know, we've all, as musicians, played those venues where the venues, the, the staff are horrible and yeah. the back and, and the people are treating everybody mean and then the air conditioning is not on and then the, everyone's complaining. It's like, that is just like, a, I don't even start. I won't even, it, it's not even on the radar. So we're, we've been really, really protective of that because I want to be enjoying myself with Jeff and then everything else flows from that. If I'm feeling great and I'm having a great time, I know that I can make everybody else in that room have a great time. So we've been we've been super precious, as they say, about making sure that that's our that's our operating plan with this. No, that's good. That's good. Why not? Why not? Congratulations on a really excellent album, which Thank you. I, I will confess to having listened to for free via Bandcamp's splendid interface. But I will put my hand in my pocket at some point and pay that's you for it. Fair enough. I always tell people any you know whether it's streamed, purchased. Or stolen, it all eventually goes to a good purpose. But hey, with with um, owl stretching, you, I'm not actually sure it was exclusive to that. You, you're asking a very very low amount, and then giving the have it all, subscribe for five dollars. Was that it? And take it all if you want it. Do I yeah, remember a, that there right? Was a couple of, there was a couple of different options. There was like a subscription model where people felt you know if they felt like supporting via that, where it was a small amount every month. But I assume after a few months, people would look at what the hell is that five dollar charge? Oh, yeah. son of a bitch! Uh, they give. But um, I tried to make the music available for that. Um, you could buy the entire catalog for like I think it was like seventy percent off, like on yeah. the digital side. So it, it, it makes it re- if you're really interested in collecting that, you can stream it, you can Spotify it, Apple it, Amazon it, whatever, whatever works. I'm just thankful that people in any capacity are paying attention and and enjoying the music and and uh, you know at the end of the day, that's that's what it's about. We've come a long way from record companies, haven't we? Yeah, screw those guys. Yeah, those middle guys. <laughs> Where are they now, huh? Where are they now? Listen, thanks very much for your time, and um, maybe we could catch up again one day. I'd love to, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. See you soon. Take thanks, care. Jason.